Uh, my name's Drive, haven't met you, really glad to see everyone again today. Um, and I do want to welcome Letitia uh, Shelton, who's with us from Toowoomba City Women. So thanks so much, uh, Letitia, for being here with us. I'm going to be giving a shorter talk um, from our passage that we're up to this week, so that there's lots of time for Letitia to share with us on the topic of men and women working together uh, for the Kingdom of God. And, and welcome to you if you're visiting with us today to, to hear from Letitia. And I know uh, that there's a bunch of people who can't be here today, but who are going to be viewing via live stream. So, so thank you uh, very much for that. But I, I was reflecting back uh, this week, uh, back to when I first moved out of home. I was 17. I went to Brisbane, and it was a bit of a weird experience, really, um, going to the University of Queensland there. I was at a, a, an all-blokes college, uh, and so I rocked up there, uh, really got the chance to eat and hang out and spend all this time with people, uh, blokes, it, it was an all-male college at that time, so blokes who were exactly the same age as me in exactly the same life stage as me. And so in one sense, it was a, it was a super rich time of fellowship because you had all these other people who were walking through an identical life stage and were just like me. But in hindsight, uh, I think that that friendship, that fellowship, uh, in some ways you might call it an unholy fellowship, and, and I'll talk more into that. And for that reason, for me at least, it was a fellowship that didn't ultimately last the test of time. How do we find healthy friendship? I, I want to start with that uh, question this morning. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was on a, a call with a psychologist. Uh, the psychologist was talking to uh, a group of Christian pastors, uh, pastors from the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, kind of uh, helping us to equip for kind of the, the post-COVID uh, reality. But in, in this call, the psychologist said a number of times, he, he, he used this language of the soothing effect of interacting with other human beings the soothing effect of interacting with other human beings. If you're feeling a bit down, uh, just to spend time hanging out with friends or, or family members often can be enough just to lift your spirits because we're relational creatures, and I, and I guess that's partly why COVID and the lockdowns that have happened around our country have been so hard, uh, because there is that just soothing effect of being around other humans. But COVID or no COVID, I don't know if you know the statistics, it hasn't actually changed all that much um, one in four Australians are still saying before COVID and after COVID, one in four Australians would say at any given time they are feeling lonely. Uh, so we, we do have this experience of loneliness. And, and I think friendship can be a tricky topic to talk around. Um, when it comes to friends, you, you don't just need depth of friendship with one or two people. I know we're all slightly different, but you, you don't just need depth with one or two. You also need breadth of friendship. You, you kind of need a bit of both. And that's not always easy to pull off. Uh, I was reading a, a book on marriage this last week, which was uh, kind of had the testimony of a couple of different married couples talking about how lonely it is to share a house and a bed with another person and yet to be lonely in that experience. Very lonely circumstance. And yet even something like church and, and coming to church and a church service on a Sunday morning, uh, I, I know I've heard people who've told of their experience of being surrounded by other people, but because of their lack of connection with those other people, it's actually been a very lonely experience for them to walk in and be around others who they feel like they should be more connected to. Is that the way that it's meant to be. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a look at this passage from Matthew chapter 11. Let's pray. Uh, loving Father, we uh, just thank you that you are a God who is in relationship. And Lord, we thank you uh, that we can come and, and seek you and learn from you. And Lord, we really pray that you would teach us today. Uh, Jesus says, uh, take on my yoke. I am gentle and humble in heart. And Lord, we do pray that we would take on that yoke and learn from him today. Work by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, uh, we're continuing to work through uh, this middle section of Matthew's Gospel today. Last week, if you were here, we talked about uh, John the Baptist and how he really got to this difficult point in his public ministry where he'd been so opposed uh, that he was feeling very alone. Uh, and Jesus, in that context, as John had brought questions to Jesus, was Jesus the one to come? Jesus was very compassionate uh, with John the Baptist in the way that he spoke to him and also the way he spoke about him. Well, today we come really to the, the series centre, if you like, as we come to these statements of Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Uh, there is this invitation into the Father's house that we're going to be looking at uh, a bit more briefly this week. 
But the big idea I want to um, share with us from this passage uh, is that really Jesus puts to us this reality that we're either uh, becoming further and further apart from other people, we either have this burden of increasing isolation or we can be walking on a path of the freedom of actually sharing our load with other people, the, the freedom of a shared life. And so I'm going to be urging us from this passage to come towards Jesus, to take on his yoke, which we will see is all about love. Um, but if you remember the, the context of this series, we'll, we'll begin with that idea of um, how Jesus talks about the, the burden of isolation. Uh, we've seen in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus has been walking around and he's been taking burdens off people's shoulders. Uh, he's been uh, sharing uh, about the Kingdom of God, he's been healing people, casting out demons, and then he set his disciples the task of really going about and conducting themselves with that same ministry. But there's an interesting thing that Jesus said to them uh, back when he first sent them out to be proclaimers of the Kingdom of God, which has to do with this idea of relationships. Have a look at chapter 10, verse 12. If you've got your Bible there, if you can just flick back a chapter from where we're looking at today and see what Jesus has to say about relationships. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 12. He's telling them that when they enter any town, they're to go and find a worthy household, as in one that will receive them. And then he says in verse 12, as you enter the home, give it your greeting. And if the home is deserving, let your peace rest upon it. But if it is not, let your peace return to you. What does it mean to be a worthy home? Well, that, that just means that they accept the message that they have to bear. Um, verse 14, if, no one will, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, says Jesus, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment for that town. Notice that language there of it being unbearable for those who had not received Jesus or his messengers. And really there's this picture here that as uh, Jesus' disciples go out, people will meet them first and foremost. And depending on their response to those disciples and the way that they engage that relationship, whether or not they receive this message of the kingdom that comes ultimately from Jesus, uh, they will either come into relationship with Jesus, with the Father, uh, and with others too, or if they reject Jesus... They're actually rejecting that message. They're rejecting Jesus. They are rejecting the Father. And they, and they really end up isolated, is the picture that Jesus is giving us. They have this unbearable load because they have to carry something themselves that they were never actually designed to carry solo. And it's interesting as you look through uh, chapter 10, uh, sorry, the, the early part of chapter 11, John. He, he's feeling like his load is too hard to bear, but he can send message to Jesus. Jesus encourages him. And, and at the end of that interchange, Jesus kind of reflects on the fact that um, just the, the world's opposition to really relationship. Jesus comes eating and drinking and they reject him as a sinner. Uh, John came with this message from God uh, fasting and, and in the desert and they say that he has a demon. And that's what really transitions into what Jesus says at the beginning of the section we're looking at, chapter 11, verse 21. See what Jesus says as he reflects on this dynamic that's happening as the message about him goes forward. Verse 21, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. These are uh, two towns on the north of the Sea of Galilee that uh, we don't actually read about in the rest of the Gospel. We take it that maybe it was even the disciples who took the message of the Kingdom to these particular towns. But he goes on, verse 21, If the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, then they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. These cities, Tyre and Sidon, they're kind of like the worst of the worst cities in the Old Testament, there's this fascinating passage in Ezekiel chapter 28 where the king of Tyre is pictured almost like Satan himself. And those cities were a picture of what happens to those who reject God and his message and his messengers. But God, uh, Jesus goes on there, verse 22, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment, these cities, than for you, and then he goes on, for you, Capernaum, a place where Jesus very clearly had been, the beginning of chapter 8 of Matthew, we've seen this. Will you be lifted up to heaven? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, uh, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom 
on the Day of Judgment than for you. Uh, if you remember the story of Sodom, and this uh, came up back in chapter 10 as well as Jesus talked to the disciples. I mean, this was a town where people were so turned against themselves, Genesis chapter 19, that as God sent his angels to that town before judgment was about to fall on it, uh, to rescue Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, rather than those angels being welcomed in that town, the people actually came to try and abuse those angelic messengers because you see they were so alone and isolated and bearing their own load that any person they could get their hand on, they would take them and use them for their own purposes. I mean, the picture of Sodom and Gomorrah is a city that has so rejected God that really the, the picture of the fire and brimstone which did fall on it is just giving us an indication of where this city is headed eternally. And it's interesting that language in this passage that Jesus keeps saying it will be more bearable for these places on the Day of Judgment than those places where Jesus and his disciples had actually gone and spoken. Uh, literally there in verse 24 when it's talking about Sodom, it's talking about the land of Sodom. And I think really Jesus is saying those places, they were, they were just a picture. As you get a picture of the relationships and the breakdown and how isolated individuals were in that city, as you see the, the fire falling upon them, I mean, that's just a picture in time and space. But Jesus is saying, if you reject me, you are headed for this reality where you will have to bear your own load to the point where you will think Sodom and Gomorrah uh, was like a holiday. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible picture that he puts before us. And really, I think what Jesus is trying to drive through is the importance of repentance. We need to keep turning to Jesus, listening to what he has to say, that we might be led into relationships with other people. I can remember in those uh, first couple of years of university, being 18, 19 years old, uh, hanging out with this group of guys who we were just utterly oblivious of anyone else that we might have been affecting as we went about our business, going out uh, at night to the pub and walking home, kind of trashing wheelie bins and doing things on the way home. We, we could not have cared less for another individual. Remember one time we were driving a car uh, into a concert on the Gold Coast and both on the way into the concert on the car and the way home, we so infuriated the other drivers on the road that, that there was literally this really quite um, full-on road rage kind of situation that happened because of the way my friend was driving, because of the fact that we were hanging out the windows just yelling at people as we went past. This is a terrible picture. And my experience of being friends with these other ones who were so like me. It was basically like loving yourself. But in the end, as I would not repent and turn to the Lord Jesus back at that time, I ended up coming to loggerheads with even them. Couldn't even get on with them. It was this picture of isolation. And today we're going to be encouraged to, to look outside of ourselves, to think about what it might be like to, to love and partner with brothers and sisters here in Christ, as Letitia speaks to us. And, and really... It flows out of the positive part of this passage that Jesus goes on to speak. Have a look at verse 25 and what he says there of chapter 11. It says, at that time, at the same time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except... Sorry, knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It's a bit of a change of gear here in the middle of the passage. Uh, Jesus has just been pronouncing woe, and then he turns to praise and kind of marvelling. And, and I, I take it what's going on for him here is as much as he can see these towns and cities who have rejected his messengers who have ultimately rejected him, at the same time as he stands there, he's looking out at this crowd of people and they are not an elite group, the best of the best who have come to follow Jesus Christ. No, they're a motley crew. Even the 12 disciples themselves came from all different segments of the society at that time. There were women as well who had come and followed after the Lord Jesus. Jesus sees this crowd of people who have come to him, the little children who the Father has chosen to reveal himself to, who Jesus 
has welcomed into his father's house. It is all the father's work. I mean, that was my experience. Once I became a Christian, uh, my third year of university, it was just this opening of eyes to other people apart from me. Go along to the church and there's people of all different age groups, not just 17, 18 year olds. Uh, Thankfully, I was part of a church that, uh, like we heard about from Roz with the kids' talk, that, that thought about the other nations. Um, my dad had done some trips over to India, so I'd already been a little bit exposed to people from other nationalities, and it, it just started to open me up to think about others. And over time, uh, God has helped me to, to value and love and think about men and women, uh, people of different ages, different cultures, different backgrounds, different educations. I wonder if that's been your experience as you've come and followed after the Lord Jesus. Well, really, uh, that's, that's the way to find relationship, uh, is to come closer to him. And we see that right at the end of the passage. Have a look at verse 28, this, this famous section to close out the chapter. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus really saying, repent. Come, come to me. Come follow me. There might be some of us here today who, uh, maybe this is your first time at church. Maybe you've been coming to church for months or even a year and you haven't yet made that decision to come and follow after Jesus. To come and take Jesus' words and to say, yes. I want to listen to you. I don't want to call the shots anymore. I want to follow after you. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you in your heart to, to just say that to Jesus in the quietness of your heart, to say, yes, Jesus, I hear your voice calling, come to me. Okay, I'm coming today. Coming today to follow you. Just to say that to him, Jesus, I'm following now. I'm following. And if you, if you make that choice, let someone know today. But the other part of this that Jesus goes on to explain is that as we do come and follow after him, there is a taking on of his yoke. We've talked about this in the series, that uh, the image that Jesus is playing around with is uh, oxen yoked together, and so they still have a load on their shoulders. But as they're joined together with these other oxen who each have their yoke on, the load is shared and they get to carry it together. And what we see with Jesus is that he, he carries the part of the load that we never could. He goes to the cross. Uh, he shows us the extent of his love, the extent of his willingness to carry our burdens. He, he pays the cost for our sins, dies in our place. But he invites us to come and now walk with him in that same journey, which is ultimately a journey of love and taking on that yoke of looking outside of ourselves, being open to love others, and also receive that love as we take on the yoke of Jesus and follow after him. And I hope today that as Letitia shares with us that maybe you're prompted to think through some ideas of what it might look like for you to love others. Um, even here as part of our church family, what it might look like for us to love. And I know for myself I've recently been challenged that even as I've kind of walked a journey of, of being increasingly aware of others, that you can, I've still had this kind of narrowing of mindset, looking to just love certain others or just looking uh, and being willing to receive love from only certain others. As we come and follow Jesus, he keeps opening us up, opening our minds to think more broadly of who he might have us relate to. Well, we started with those few questions at the beginning. Uh, how do we find healthy relationships? How do we deal with loneliness? Are friendships meant to be so difficult? And really, we've seen the answer is that Jesus puts before us, we, we can be on one of two paths. We're either headed towards increasing isolation as we take the full burden on ourselves, or we come and follow after Jesus and get to share life with him, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We get welcomed into the the triune being, and we get a family uh, in his church and amongst his people. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I saw Letitia shared a, a post on Facebook. Letitia's been um, running uh, Toowoomba City Women, an organisation that uh, helps women to, to come together and to serve the city. She's been doing that for 21 years, she said to me this morning uh, in Toowoomba, and so she's going to have some great uh, stories to share with us of what it looks like to, to love others 
uh, in our city. Um, but the, the post that Letitia shared, it was uh, kind of talking about the fact that uh, she's been a, a single lady through her life. Uh, and she, she listed that there were two uh, difficult things for her as a single lady. The first one, um, a bit tongue in cheek, um, she had this photo attached to the post. Uh, and she talked about the experience of going to a wedding when the, the bride kind of throws the, the bouquet for the single ladies to catch. And Letitia's problem with that was not that um, she wanted to catch the bouquet because she was unhappy with her singleness, but she's competitive, and so it just didn't work out well for her. Uh, so she's decided that's, that's not for her anymore. <laughs> I thought that was good. Um, but, but the other thing that Letitia shared uh, was thinking through what, what does it look like as a single female to, to be fruitful for the kingdom, and that has been something that's been uh, a deeper thing to think through for her. Um, and, and really she's come to see how God has borne great fruit through her life as she has come and followed after the Lord Jesus. But she made this comment about how as she's done that, part of the fruitfulness has come from partnerships, not just with the women in uh, Toowoomba City Women, but also with the blokes who have partnered with her, the, the local mayor, her dad who's a pastor, other pastors and business leaders in town. And I just... I was intrigued. I, I wanted to hear more. I wanted to hear Letitia speak more about that. So that's what she's here for this morning. So uh, I, I'm going to pass over now. I think Kate's going to come and lead us in prayer. Uh, we're then going to hear from Letitia as she shares her experiences and, and lessons that she's learned about men and women relating, to, relating together. Uh, but really, I, I want us to keep in mind this picture that it's as we come and follow Jesus uh, that we can actually learn to, to work together and move together. Thanks, Kate. 